So welcome to you all and welcome Jenny. And perhaps we could start Jenny by asking you to give us a few slides to explain more about the Cream Tea Project. So thank you very much, o over to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for um, welcoming welcome, welcome us. Um, so I will just run through a few slides to tell you all about what the Cream Tea Project has been doing. And then I'll be introducing the team at the end, and then we'll look forward to some Q&A session with you. So hopefully the slides have uh, come through on your screen share now. So I better start off with saying, well, what does cream tea actually stand for? Um, we haven't just named it after a scone and jam because we've been working in Devon and Cornwall. Cream tea was actually coastal resi resistance, alerts and monitoring technologies. And that's because we're a team of people interested in coastal hazards. Uh, and this project is mainly focusing on wave overtopping hazard, which we see a lot around our coastline in the UK. So what were the aims of our project? Well, we wanted to develop a set of hazard monitoring systems that could provide near time, near real time information for hazard responders, but provide this information alongside existing networks that are already based around the UK. We needed to demonstrate that our systems worked. So we've installed equipment in Dawlish and Penzance over the winter period 2021 to 2022. So the photo with the train line is Dawlish. Uh, you can see all of our equipment installed there side by side. So we've got camera systems, we've got a wire wall system, which is measuring the individual waves going over the seawall. And we've also got a B-scan system, which is a laser-based system measuring the beach level in front of the seawall. And altogether, we're measuring the impact of conditions at the land-sea interface. But also it's very important to engage the public. Um, so we've also had a team of digital artists working alongside us and they've been developing a walking app to help promote our work with the public. And it also raises awareness of citizen science initiatives in the local areas um, that have been involved in coastal hazard monitoring. So again, the photo is just showing our app and it, here I've got a little time lapse, which is showing some of the citizen science pictures that are part of that um, phone app. So we have coast snap posts where people can take their own photos, submit them to the Plymouth Coastal Observatory to help with beach monitoring, um, monitoring the beach levels in different locations. And we've incorporated that information into this app so people can actually see what's going on at the beach, even if it's a hot sunny day and they can have visuals of the wave conditions and the changing beach levels. So some of the technology we've had installed, uh, we have the B-Scan, which has been installed by Plymouth University, and this has been measuring the beach level at every low tide on both of our sites, and they, that team have been working at um, transmitting this data into one of their numerical models, which they use to forecast coastal hazard in the southwest region. So by collecting this information, we can compare it to existing networks of information about waves and water levels to better understand beach response to offshore conditions. But we can also put the beach levels in near real time into operational hazard warning systems to improve our forecasts. So this is just one of the graphs that have come from uh, this modeling system. So the model is called OWL, Operational Waves and Water Levels. And the black thick line is just showing um, the forecast from the model using a static beach level. And then the purple shaded area is showing what the forecast could look like if you incorporate the variability in the beach level. So you can see there's a, a range in the overtopping predictions. This is for Dawlish, this photo, depending on what beach level you incorporate within your forecasting model. So it's very important to have the real beach level at the time of the forecast to give the best possible predictions. So alongside that, we've had the wire wall systems. There's a photo of it in the bottom corner being splashed with waves, quite big waves at Dawlish. Uh, and this has been now casting observational information about hazards on our sites. And the British Oceanographic Data Centre have set up an online dashboard to allow people to visualise this data in near real time. So you go to the dashboard and um, you can see the wire wall data um, colour coded as a hazard category. And below it, we've also used APIs to bring in the waves, water levels and wind conditions from existing networks, from the Environment Agency's tide gauges, 
Plymouth Coastal Observatory's wave buoys and also MET stations run by the MET Office. So this provides a one-stop shop uh, that introduces all of the different conditions in one location so hazard responders can see what's going on. It also allows you to look at the real-time information on site and compare that with forecast information uh, just to start to understand the validity of forecast services and identify if any improvements are needed. So then the final bit is getting people involved, citizen science and engagement. So we've developed a, a walking app which combines two walks, one at each site. The walks are about 40 minutes and they're accessible along walkways and they use digital art, so augmented reality, to visualise what's been going on at our coast and they also have a poetic narration to discuss um, coastal change to get people involved with what's happening at the coast. Both walks go past the coast snap post where people can put their own smartphone in a cradle and take a photo to upload it to the Plymouth Coastal Observatory and this contributes um, to the beach monitoring at these sites. Recently, we've been running walking workshops and local workshops to engage the public so they actually get involved, use the walks and promote them themselves. So in the October half term, we've just had a walking event run by Newland Art Gallery. Um, so we've had people um, using our phone app. So there's already been 144 downloads of the app since July, um, and it's going to be maintained for the next two years. And it's available on both Apple and Google stores. So I think that's kind of the summary of our project. Um, so we're looking forward to taking your questions and the people from the Cream Tea Project who will be joining me today. We've got Kit and Tim from the University of Plymouth. So Kit is an expert in coastal hazard forecasting. He does a lot of the numerical predictions. Tim has a lot of experience in coastal observations, um, installing equipment at the beach. Then from the National Oceanography Centre, I've got Lou Darrick joining me. So she's one of our data managers in the British Oceanographic Data Centre. So she's very interested in data streaming, telemetry, and the vis visualisation of near real-time information so other people can use it. And then from our team of artists, I have Sarah joining us, and she'll be talking about the artistic communications. And her key skill is um, the poetic narration that's accompanied our walking app. So thanks for listening. And um, I will hand back to Steve to Q Q chair our Q&A. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks ever so much. That's fantastic, Jenny. A great uh, introduction uh, to, to this fascinating project. So. Um, Everyone online listening, um, what what would what I, there's a, there's a number of themes that I think we'd like to uh, discuss really about this. And so first of all, we'll we'll think about the, the 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 challenge, the scope of the project, and then we'll move on to some of the technology that we've just been hearing about and find find out a bit more about that. And then we'll move on to the some of the policy aspects of this important work uh, before sort of summing up. And as we pass through each of these uh, themes. Please, as Cameron has said, bang in your questions into the Q and A uh, section, and we'll try and pick up as many of those as as we can. But uh, I mean, uh, as we as we start off, then perhaps thinking about the the challenge, uh, Kit, I wonder if you could sort of outline the you know what, what are the challenges that you've been facing in in this uh, project? What are the environmental challenges, and how how how, do, how does that affect lives and society in in the southwest? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, the challenge, I guess, we're really trying to tackle is, uh, is is all based around coastal overtopping and coastal flooding. Um, now, coastal overtopping, you know, is usually uh, a nuisance. It, it can disrupt transport links. <clears throat> it can cause a hazard to pedestrians at the coast. Um, but when that coastal overtopping gets more extreme, it can lead to coastal flooding. And, you know, that can really uh, affect livelihoods and can actually, you know, cause fatalities at the coast. So, Really, we're trying to bring in new ways of foreseeing when this is going to happen in the near future, but also being able to monitor the coast in real time to say when it is actually happening right here and now. Uh, and these are both really important things because, you know, coastal managers and decision makers who are in charge of keeping everyone safe and monitoring these things, they can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, they don't have enough eyes and feet on the ground 
to you know to monitor the whole coastline continuously. So you need this sort of digital technology um, in order to see when these things will happen and also to say you know we've got a problem right now uh, mm -hmm. we need to take action so that's really the, the challenge we're facing um, just to put some more bigger picture numbers on that as well um, sea level rise is predicted to uh, sorry sea level is predicted to rise as most of us uh, know um, you know in terms of the magnitude of that it's been predicted that we'll get about 10 centimeters of sea level rise in the next 10 to 30 years and that doesn't sound like a huge amount, you know, 10 centimeters is quite small, um, but actually what that means in terms of coastal flooding um, is that potentially extreme coastal flooding could double in frequency. So with just 10 centimeters of sea level rise, we could have twice as many extreme flooding events in the next 10 to 30 years. So, you know, this is a, an impending problem that, uh, that could be quite significant around our coastlines. Yeah, absolutely. And, and ju just in terms of the sort of geographical scope, is it is it just looking at Dawlish at the moment? Um, and then perhaps you could use these approaches el elsewhere in, in future. I think that's the idea, is it? Um, so, I mean, we've got, a, I guess we've got a few different layers to this. One is the, the in situ observations, which um, Jenny and Tim and others will talk a little bit more about. Those were just happening at Dawlish and Penzance for this, mm -hmm. uh, for this project. Um, the forecasting of overtopping you know, that we're doing currently happens all around the southwest of the UK. Um, but actually, you know, the, the intention is in future to be able to roll this out further afield. Mm, oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, this whole this whole sort of exercise that, that we're um, looking at through the constructing digital environment uses this phrase digital environment. And uh, I know we, we've had some interesting discussions with people about what digital environment actually might mean. Um, both on a scientific level and, and a, a sort of artistic level. And I just wonder, you know, maybe look into your team, what, maybe, maybe Lou, I could start with you. What, what does digital environment mean? And what are your perspectives on, on what digital environment has to offer your, your science and art collectively? Hey, thanks, Steve. Um, so for me, I think um, digital environment is about taking advantage of um, the digital revolution. Um, it's about um, using that to really enhance our understanding of in environmental science. And uh, I think when I use the phrase uh, digital revolution, I'm, I'm talking about advances in sensor, sensing technologies, taking advantage of um, sensors on mobile phones. And then we can also take advantage of the, the technologies that are used to, to analyze that data and to host that data as well, to make that analysis effective. So we can take advantage of things like artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics, data visualizations. Um, I would actually add software and hardware into this um, really, yeah. as well, because um, that, that actually helps with the effective analysis. Um, and I think if we can actually sort of group lots of different data streams up into 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 sense of networks, then we have really great potential sort of tackling these environmental um, challenges, not not just on a global scale, but also um, on sort of more local scales. So we can we can use them in innovative ways to benefit society. Hmm. In terms of our project. What we've done is we've we've taken advantage of novel sensing technologies and and, and technologies like the Internet of Things, um, and we've been able to sort of group data up into APIs, essentially into APIs, so we can actually create our our sensor networks, and then we we're able to use data visualization to actually inform communities. And not only communities, uh, in the image that um, Jenny showed, there's, there's a railway network in Dawlish, so we were able to actually um, inform uh, trans transport operators as well um, about the immediate risks of coastal hazards. I suppose it's a way of democratising data, isn't it, with APIs and yeah. visualisations? You're, you're able to share your findings with a wide community of people, really. Yeah, exactly. So we were able to actually use that technology and, and enable it to sort of help people make decisions, essentially. I mean, 
I'm interested, you have a very um, interdisciplinary uh, team and Sarah, I think you're as a writer and a maker um, and with your, your background, what, what, what's your take on digital environment and, and what is it about digital that, that helps you with your, your work? Well, I think, I think um, in regard to this project, uh, I'd see the digital environment as augmented reality. So it's using both the physical reality and the the sort of site specific nature of being somewhere and augmenting that with uh well in this particular project the visualization of data through the citizen science that jenny mentioned with the coast snap so the um uh, stop uh, sort of stop motion of the photos that people submitted also um overtopping imagery we used within the uh, uh, app and then also using the APIs that Lou mentioned to embed uh, some of the wind speeds, the actual wind speeds of, of the moment into the narrative so that people are both in the situation and being encouraged to look look very sort of deeply in into where they are and see how it can be in other, in other, um, in other weathers. So there is this sort of, you're straddling two time zones as it were so you're sort of straddling a present moment kind of like really um feeling the, the wind the waves and also thinking about being asked to think about and see and visualize what the um what has happened and therefore this sort of um sort of split sense of change i think is very uh impactful from a visual uh, the digital uh element of this project so that you can sort of bring these time zones together which hopefully kind of evokes uh, an emotive response. And I think as well, because the um, the walking app is on smartphones, they, it, the narrative is GPS triggered. So people actually have an agency within the narrative so that they can determine how fast they walk, how um, or how slow, when they actually get to um, get to places along the walk. So they, I think that agency also enables um, a, se a sense of uh yeah sort of deepening their own uh, ability to uh not necessarily steer a story but certainly guide the story and their involvement in it which yeah they're, they're really part of it aren't they that's the that's the thing yeah that's yeah. it and we're asking them to sort of really become immersed in it so it's it's an audio visual story uh so that's yeah so that's sort of a layer on top of the walk they're already taking rather than yeah it's very interesting bringing that alongside the engineering challenges that you're you're facing. I and mean, Tim, we, we had a, a brief chat at the beginning about the the scope of uh, of this. I'm just wondering, um, you know, how, how easy it would be to sort of transplant these approaches elsewhere and and um, you know expand expand even the research research topics uh, at all. What, what are your thoughts on on expanding the scope? <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the the project has demonstrated very effectively in the in the southwest how we can access data in a sort of near real time <laughs> manner, and that can then be used to inform decision making around the coastline. So it can help sort of uh, coastal managers, coastal response to to sort of utilize their resources as as best possible. And so we we sort of talk a lot in society about smart technology. And I think, you know, there's a stage we could get to with smart coastlines where we have the sort of technology that we have um, deployed during the cream tea project, but sort of embedded into our coastline. So that could be part of structures, part of defenses, and they're providing the same sort of data back to coastal managers. <laughs> So that they can sort of understand what's happening in a, in a sort of real time manner. And, and as I say, that would allow them to sort of make better decisions in terms of their resources. So it, it certainly can expand beyond the Southwest. It was is really, we, we chose our locations because we wanted to, to ensure we were in areas where we knew that we were gonna get overtopping. We know that storms are a, a big factor, but the rest of the UK experiences similar, similar climate. So it, it could certainly sort of spread um, around the around the UK a lot more. Thank you. I mean, I see I see a few questions coming up in the chat, and thank you very much for those. And and Paul John Canning, you you've just asked um, a question there about plans to set up instruments at any other hotspot locations around the UK, Tim. So I mean, I guess what what you're saying is that's possible. But are, are there are there any plans at the moment within? 
So, um, as Jenny briefly mentioned, the, the sort of the, the components or the instruments we had out. One of them was the B scan, which is which is something that Plymouth has been um, been working on, and, and that measures the elevation of the beach in front of a, a structure. And, and as uh, Jenny talked about that, the, the elevation of the beach has an impact on the overtopping forecast. So if, if we have really good information about the beach profile, then our forecast will be more accurate, more reliable, and ultimately more useful. So we've, um, we had them at Dawlish and Penzance. We've, uh, we've got one installed in Torcross in South Devon, uh, which has just been out for about a, a month now. Um, and we've also got one at Hailing Island which is looking um, at the back of the, the beach, it actually measures the sort of the crest height um, mm. there. So again, it's being used by the, the coastal managers to, to give them real time information as to how that crest is. Um, and, and what this ultimately does is that it, it means that you don't have to go down, physically go down to the beach and measure these profiles. We're, we're very fortunate in the UK to have an excellent coastal monitoring program, um, but even that only provides beach information sort of twice a year. Um, so it's it's very good, but at the same time it's it's limited. So if you're if you've got a forecast in uh, in sort of January time, the profile that you might be using for that may not have been collected and since October or something. So it improves our accuracy. Thanks, thanks, Tim. And I mean, Lou, I see you you've got your hand up. Uh, I'm just going to actually move move on to ask you a question, if I may, and then you can answer both at the same time. Uh, I mean, I think I think th thanks for the questions coming in, and I think maybe uh, that's given us an idea of the scope. I'm just moving to the sort of technologies that you, you're using, Lou. I mean, it's a pretty harsh environment. I I don't know whether it's the what, what's the most harsh, the sea or the public. Uh, or what, what, whatever the uh, the challenges you are, but what sort of technologies have you actually got out there? And by the way, do feel free to answer the uh, point you were just putting your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say, actually, one of the one of the things that we've done, particularly with the the, the data system and, and in interfacing into that data system, is enable us to be able to effectively plug and play those sensors. So in that way, you can. Um, transfer the sensors to sort of strategic hotspots, um, essentially. Um, in terms of the actual instrumentation out on the um, out on the uh, key side there, I have to admit, I, I don't know that much about it <laughs> um, and its resilience. Um, I've actually been told earlier on today that, that dogs are quite harsh <laughs> on the um, instrumentation as well. But I might actually... Um, and this uh, question over to, to Jenny, yeah. who probably has a better explanation. You can see Kit's got his hand up. As yeah. Well. yeah, Kit's got his hand up as well. Would you, um, Kit, would you mind if Jenny has a quick answer and then we'll come to you? Is that, is that okay? Jenny, please. So um, while the instruments are out there, uh, we've got the waves throwing water at them, but also any debris that's on the beach can be thrown up in the waves. So there could be um, pebbles, uh, all sorts of rubbish, anything down there could be thrown on it. The instruments were protected from the public, so the um, kind of the wire wall system that looks a bit like a climbing frame did have a, a fencing around it to make sure people didn't climb on it or climb on it and jump off the seawall. So public safety was included within our installations. We've also had Twitter feeds running to kind of promote our work with the public to get local buy-in and by also having the walking workshops, the local communities knew that we were there and what we were doing. Um, the, the comment about the dogs is because some of our posts are up against the railway line wall or they're up against railings. So, yes, people do walk their dogs and yes, they do like to lift their leg occasionally. So we do have the odd stray data point. Um, so we've had to add in QC to take out random odd little points uh, that aren't overtopping, but dogs walking along. Um, but there's been no vandalism to any of the systems while they were out on site. Um, and of course, Plymouth had a camera up there as well. So we did kind of have a bit of an, a visual of what was going on. Um, and we need, needed to do that with the train line being there because there was a lot of safety implications. So obviously, our kit couldn't pose a risk if it came unbolted during a storm. It couldn't go over the railway line itself. Oh, my goodness. Yes, absolutely. I can imagine. Um, yeah. So, so I would say probably the environment was the harshest thing on the kit um, that was out at the beach because it is a harsh environment. Always nervous about public vandalism, but actually all the locals on site have been great. So, yeah, I don't know if Kit wanted to add anything else to that. I was actually just going to try and answer some questions in the Q&A. Um, Tim got back to Steve McFarlane, who asked about whether we were just monitoring a single profile or, or the whole seawall. 
Um, and as Tim says, we were measuring a single profile and, you know, we, we did actually, uh, we had more than one wall out, as Jenny will be able to say, to sort of just see how much the overtopping varied along the length of seawall. Um, but there's a kind of related question as well from David Mills about developing a digital twin solution. Yeah. And I, I kind of see these as related because, you know, I think ultimately to have a digital twin, you need to be um, representing the whole you know, local environment in a sort of two dimensional or three dimensional or even more dimensional sense. Um, and, and I think for this project, it was really about, you know, can we start off simple and represent the coast as a single profile and replicate what's happening to, to a good degree, um, you know, without jumping ahead and trying to make, to represent everything in three dimensions. And, um, you know, often that, that ends up meaning that you have um, very computationally heavy models and you have to, you know, have a huge data stream of, of three dimensional data. Um, so we, we were starting simple in, in this project, you know, to answer that question and, and starting with profiles. Yeah, thanks for that question. I was going to ask the same, uh, the same one, so that was very good. Um, so we have technology and we have people and we have the environment. And Sarah, when we think about technology and, and people, where, where, do you, where do you draw the, the boundary between? How do you, how do you find the, the interaction between, the, between people and, and technology? And, and you know what 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 was this project taught us about the way that we uh, involve public and stakeholders with with science? I think you're muted as well, by the way, Sarah. Just uh, pop yourself off. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think the question around the boundaries between technology and people obviously very very blurred. I mean, I think the um, for me, what what be, became evident when we ran both the workshops and the the trial runs with locals was how much people responded to, to our the turning of uh, what might be seen as abstract data or a sort of data distant data into a meaningful story that kind of generated empathetic empathetic responses. So people were suddenly seeing what might have been a very familiar environment to them. In a, in a new way and, and sort of having a space to consider their own responses to the inevitability of, of change and specifically coastal change. I mean, you know, people are resistant generally to change and in Dawlish particularly, the sea wall had a very mixed response uh, from the locals. So to sort of um, ask people to take a, a walk that is, you know, obviously not one that they've done before because it has this augmented reality um, element to it. Was, just, was both using a site that was potentially controversial and asking them to sort of reconsider their their own um, story within it. And, um, and I think that on the whole, uh, people were very responsive to that opportunity to, to rethink. Uh, and it's a sort of like a soft introduction really to the inevitability to change and not asking them to sort of like have to um, intellectually compute and process so it's much more um of an embodied experience because of it being a walk uh, and uh, a storytelling narrative and um a sort of this um yeah sort of space for reflection i suppose so i think that that uh that that seemed to be a very um uh, positive outcome i mean i think yeah. one of the issues was the fact that it's an app so it's hidden so getting the word out was more problematic and again in Dawlish it was set on the seawall the seawall is still being built because of the extreme environment so you know it's been it was closed for a couple of months over, over that time but we've got two years for people seems, to engage it seems like it. people have taken to it very well though it's a, it's, a, it's a really great great example of the project um there's, thank you very much for all the questions coming in and there's a there's a question which I'm going to put to the, the 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 techies here which is from thomas mansfield thank you for that thanks for presenting this really interesting project uh, indeed so the work to create a near real-time dashboard looks really useful can you provide any more information about the architecture or the standards you've used uh, in building that please who's going to answer that <laughs> i think i can answer that one um okay. so at the moment are uh, the um the now cast data is being transmitted from um, the sensors um, basically into being dropped essentially into an API, a data brokering API. And the API we've used actually is called ERDAP, which was developed by um, NOAA in the um, US. 
and then we we're pulling in data streams from um, surrounding environmental sensors as well to help sort of complement that and um, create a more comprehensive um, dashboard of hazard information. You're enriching the data, aren't you? By exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the dashboard was actually just um, uh, uh, just a really sort of quick demo in a way. Um, I actually built it in Bootstrap Dash, so using my Python skills. Um, and we've actually deployed that on the cloud as well. So we, we've deployed it on Heroku Cloud. Ah, cool. Um, very interesting. I think we could have a whole uh, whole webinar series on all of these different questions. Um, now, the, the, another question is coming from Steve McFarland, and I think in a sense that's the impetus to turn from the technology to the next theme we were going to consider, which is more about the, the, the policy and the policy relevance and, and how, we, uh, how we reach out to the stakeholders that, that we have. And maybe, maybe we should start with um, Steve, thank you for your question. And um, maybe Jenny, this is one for you in the first instance. And Steve asked, do you have any examples at Dawlish, for example, where different decisions have actually been taken by managers because of the information you provided? Uh, for example, closing the line or not closing the line, the, the decision, uh, or, or any idea of what the financial or safety implications are of these more informed decisions. And I'm just, you know, wondering as Steve is what the does does that that information help justify the cost with with budget holders? So it's going to take us time to actually be able to use our data to perhaps influence a decision. So we've got all the data and we are in discussion with Network Rail um, about how we can use this data. And the first job is actually to look at the processes offshore that have caused overtopping. We have to remember this was a research project which was only there for one winter season. So it's not something that um, will be maintained at that site to become a, a new way of informing operational decisions because it, it's not there continually. So what we can do is look at our one year's worth of data. We can start understanding the conditions when overtopping occurs and start to try and quantify how much um, overtopping occurs. We did have a system inland of the railway line as well towards the end of the project. So we can start looking at what conditions actually cause the overtopping to cross the tracks and what cause it to only cross the public walkway. So we will be working with Network Rail to see if we can help refine their um, operational hazards safety system. Um, but because we don't remain on site, we can't then test to see what the impacts are. So it is a demonstration project. We got the sensors out, we got the data gathered, and now we're working with Network Rail to see how this information could be used by them um, to help their work. It, it might also be worth saying Penzance, um, there, there's also Coast, the Environment Agency there are looking at kind of adaptive management for the frontage. So again, in Penzance, we've had multiple systems. We've collected information about spatial variability on the overtopping there. Uh, and they've shared that data with Atkins, a consultant that they're working with, uh, looking at options for that site. And they're using the information to identify present day events that perhaps do cause overtopping that they can then use in their numerical predictions to explore future management scenarios. Um, so we're at the point where we've collected the data and we're sharing the data but perhaps a, an actual change or an actual decision hasn't really been made using it, but we're working towards that as a, a goal. Well, you've, set, you've set the scene for it, haven't you? I mean, I'm interested, you're, you're, you're mixing together lots of data from your own sensors, from other, other sources, and one of the sources is the Environment Agency, and you've just mentioned, mentioned them. I mean, they, they must be very uh, fascinated to see how this project develops and, and may help to guide some of their thinking about the way they monitor uh, the coast future. Yeah, so I, I can see Tim's got his hand up. So the Environment Agency have been very engaged with the project. They're very interested in the data um, and they're regularly kind of checking their own hazard forecasting services. So they're interested in using our data to see if they can use this in their own review and validation of their services. And we're sharing the data. Um, so I'll, I'll pass to Tim to see what he'd like yeah. to add. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of to build on that a little bit. And I think that the difficulty with these sort of research based projects that are a, a short period is, is obviously getting sort of longer term buy in 
from from people like the Environment Agency or, or Network Rail. They've obviously got their own systems in place, which are more than likely commercial systems that they they're sort of paying for. And often when you're kind of providing something almost free to them, it, it, it sort of disrupts things a little bit to them just for a short period. And there's a there's a sort of difficulty in trying to sort of get that engagement um, just for that short, short period that, that we exist. The the OWL model that we have provides overtopping forecasts for about 300 locations in the southwest. And that is freely available to to anybody online, including the Environment Agency. And we know that they use that as part of their risk management. So when they're looking at forecasts, they use it alongside other forecasts. It's not sort of formally adopted, if you like, but it's it's used by the, the team when they've got a, a sort of flood warning in place. But trying to sort of get the the sort of detail of when that forecast has influenced a decision and um, either sort of meant they haven't gone out to a site or they have gone out to a site is, is very difficult be because of the fact that they have these multiple sources of forecasts and, and sort of multiple angles that they're looking at trying to sort of really refine what impact it's having is 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 difficult i think it's it's something that is increasingly important and and the the project the owl project was was very much focused on impact and trying to sort of um identify that um but it, it's something that is hard when you're you're sort of providing something for free and and the client isn't essentially paying for it there's less impetus on them to really monitor the the value of it I mean, I guess I guess you're you're trying novel approaches and you're sharing your uh, methods and your work practices with with these stakeholders and saying, you know, here, here's here's what we've found and and uh, they can put it against what they're doing and so on. There's a there's an interesting question actually. Thank you, Catherine, on on uh, this topic. And Catherine uh, uh, asks, do you have any views on what types of digital monitoring might be the most cost effective? in capturing changes in beach profiles, a wave overtopping in the future. So it's sort of almost a cost cost benefit analysis of some of these approaches you've you've looked at. Yeah, I think, I mean, if I just start perhaps on the, the sort of the beach side of things and, and we can sort of build from there, the, the, the technology isn't hugely expensive. The, the scanners that we're using are increasingly sort of becoming cheaper. It's the same technology that's used in sort of um, for self-driving cars, the sort of LiDAR technology. Um, so it's it's not hugely expensive. The, the difficulty is is getting it getting it in place somewhere where it can see the beach and a structure um, that it's it's able to sort of mount somewhere where it's not going to be damaged during obviously large conditions. Um, also, that the struggle is power. So we we ran ours as self-contained solar powered systems and. You know, during the winter time, we'd be probably having to change batteries maybe every couple of months. Some sites are, are better than others. Um, so that's an obvious sort of cost implication in terms of running it and, and maintaining it. Um, so, the, you know, for a system like B-Scan, it may be only sort of £5,000 to, to build the hardware, but it's the ongoing cost that's then needed to sort of maintain it and manage it and, and sort of roll that out to, to many sites. Um, I think maybe Kit might want to jump in on, on sort of the overtopping side of things, but it's, yes, there's there's sort of the infrastructure is relatively cheap, but it's all the back end, the sort of the modelling and, and managing that, that I think will sort of add the costs. Yes, Kit, do, uh, do chip in. Yeah, I mean, I think modelling is another way that you can have a, um, you know, a digital perspective on the coastline. Um, it's obviously not monitoring, so models are... Um, always have some level of uncertainty about them and, and they're never 100% correct all the time. Um, so modeling, modeling is, you know, in a way, it's the most cost effective way of, of knowing what's happening at the coast, but it's not always 100% accurate. Um, another thing that sprung to mind is, you know, people will often these days think of um, remotely sensed data, so satellite data and things like that, um, mm -hmm. certainly for observing coastal change. Um, but there, but you know, and while that while that covers huge geographic areas and and is becoming increasingly cheap to use, um, there's limitations in what you can do with it. You know, there's there's only a certain number of passes that the satellites over your stretch of coastline. Um, you know, you can sometimes have days, weeks, or even months in between data points for a given location from satellite data. So so even something like that isn't necessarily the ideal solution. I mean, one of the so you're trying lots of different tools and techniques and approaches and modeling and, and again you're working with stakeholders who have established uh, methods that are in place and you're sort of sharing your your 
findings with them. And, and one of the questions that's just come in here from David Mills, thank you, David, is um, to what degree you're able to demonstrate that the solutions that you're putting in place in this program are, are, are an improvement on, on existing uh, or current capacity. And um, also, if, you, if you're thinking about is one thing better than something else, how, how do you define better? Uh, as it were, and there's a, there's a question for you. I can have a go at that one and other people can chip in. Um, so I guess we're not we're not looking for better. We're looking at what are the knowledge gaps in data and understanding and can we fill them with new technologies? Um, and I guess the reason there are perhaps gaps in information is because uh, monitoring networks they're quite low density points. You've got tide gauges around the coastline, you've got wave buoys around the coastline. But when you're managing a specific site, you need the information on that site. So we're looking at kind of relocatable instruments uh, that you can install temporarily to collect that added information, but link it back to the a national monitoring system. So we're trying to collect the spatial variability on a site and get more details about the individual processes. So our interest is perhaps low cost sensors um, the costs come in with the staff time to get them installed, maintain them, uh, but instruments that can be put on a site and get that site specific information to complement uh, other monitoring. I think that's what I would say. I think Kit would like to say a bit more on that. Well, uh, all right. Well, I, I would say good answer. And um, looking at the clock, I, I wonder, Kit, if, if we may uh, thank you for your hand up, but if, thank you. Maybe, maybe we could actually looking in the last sort of 10 minutes or so of the time we have, just think about a little bit more about a sort of retrospective. You, you've had this project, it's been running, and, and I'm interested now in some of the learning points that have come from this. And Sarah, I, mean, I wonder if I could come back to you and just explore a little bit more about the digital environment and the approaches that we've, you know, we've been hearing about and how, how these approaches can actually aid the conduct and, and advancement of environmental science? Uh, you know, what are the strengths of the, the sort of approaches that, that uh, Cream Tea has taken? I think, I think regarding um, how it can aid public uh, engagement with environmental science is that it offers the chance to fuse multiple perspectives. So both, and, and different ways of both knowing, reading and seeing the world. So, you know, you it's sort of combining scientific and experiential um, data, uh, looking at sort of space and time, so fusing, like I said before, sort of fusing these things together. So it offers both a different way of presenting the world and then also different ways of, or it, it can appeal to different ways of processing and learning from it. So it isn't, so yeah, so it just has that sort of multi multiplicity of, of layers and levels and in, in engagement with the world that I think uh, enables a, a wider understanding and hopefully a wider opportunity for people to think and, and to consider what they might be facing and how they feel about it and engagement as well with with yeah. what is of course a, an issue that affects us all really so that's, that's sure. very very topical at the moment of course with what's going on in uh, cop 27 yeah um, thank you very much i mean just just thinking back about um lou um, if i may just come to you you know what Constructing a digital environment. What 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 are the strides we're making in this theme? And you know what what are the challenges as you see it that 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 still have to be grappled with in the future? You're you're on mute as well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think we we managed to sort of address um, a, a few of the issues within the um, digital environment theme. We've been able to. Sort of now cast hazard information um, from a sense of network to be able to feed back to um, communities in, in real time. We've shown that we can we can raise community awareness um, through citizen science and mobile applications. And we've shown that we can actually validate predictions about um, overtopping forecasts. Um, in terms of this project, one of one of the things we could probably do better is take more advantage um, of some of the analyzing technologies. Um, so take more advantage of 
um, data analysis and um, uh, machine learning, for example, and be able to, to develop um, short time forecasts, so sort of one hour forecasts that would actually be more powerful um, for hazard responders and, and, and for communities um, to see what potentially is going to happen in, in the short term as opposed to what is happening um, um, now. I think also um, the sensor networks on their own probably aren't going to be sufficient to be able to tackle some of the, the bigger environmental challenges that we have. So being able to interface our sensor networks with higher um, order technologies like digital twins, I think would be incredibly powerful for, mm -hmm. for tackling some of those bigger environmental issues like um, climate change. I mean, one of the issues you, you mentioned there was citizen science. And um, <laughs> it, seems, it seems to me that the way this project's developed, you've, you've really reached out to people to help you with the, the data that you're collecting. And, and, you know, Lou and perhaps Tim as well, it really, what is the role for, for citizen science? And what, what are the sort of pitfalls perhaps of looking to citizen science for, for generating data in projects like this? I think, I think citizen, citizen science is incredibly powerful because um, you can collect more data in more varied places. Um, and we were talking about filling in the gaps um, in our knowledge earlier. I, th I think one of the pitfalls is the quality of the data that comes through. Um, and there may be some limitations on that, which may sort of affect your analysis and your interpretation of the data. Is that, is that your experience, Tim, as well? Yes, I think um, the, the Coast Snap that Jenny talked about was part of this project. So that's a, it's a global um, citizen science project. So um, it's a, a started off in, the, in, in Australia and it's, yeah, it's all about um, utilising the smartphones we all have in our pockets to, to take photos and, and monitor our coast. So video images have been used for, for decades to, to monitor coastal change. And because we've all got these kind of cameras with us, they can they can sort of build that database up. And so it's a really nice example of a very accessible citizen science approach. It still requires back end processing and and sort of tools in order to get something useful out of it. Um, but I think that even if the, the the sort of the the benefits are that person reading a sign and thinking for five minutes about the coast and what what is going on that that probably merits the effort that's sort of required sort of for the other side so it it doesn't need too much um sort of output if you like for the for the benefits just in communication with with the public i think to to make it work and be, and be worth doing yeah absolutely i mean we we've heard um Kit, coming to you, we, we've heard a lot about the digital approaches and how they've helped with the science and how, how it's been a good thing. I'm just, just wondering the flip side of that. Are there, are there areas or are there particular scientific challenges where the digital approach perhaps hasn't worked as well as, as what it could? And what, what are some learning points from that, please? I mean, I think there's, I think wherever there's an environmental challenge, you can um, find some sort of digital tool that will help either, you know, modeling or observations um, that will help. But I think, I think it really comes down to having the right tools for the job. Um, you know, it's always tempting with, for instance, modeling to try and perfectly recreate reality and, and have as close to the real thing as possible. Well, actually, that's not always the best approach, um, you know, the, the sort of modeling mantra is to have the simplest solution possible that does a decent job. Uh, you know, and the reason for that is if you've got this really heavy duty, fancy model that, that reproduces every physical process, often it takes so long to actually run these simulations that it doesn't become useful anymore. Uh, and so it's really picking the right level of detail and the right level of granularity that gives you the answer you need, but not much more than that. Um, because then you can start to apply these more simple models on a much broader scale. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where I think that the digital environment becomes really useful is when you can apply it, you know, in lots mm. of dimensions, uh, and over lots of temporal scales. Indeed, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, interesting questions just popped up from David Mills about the, the actual carbon footprint of some of these digital solutions 
and, and is that a downside? And I, I know, for example, there's a, a, a project you know, undergoing uh, a consideration in, in NERC at the moment, looking at the digital footprint of some of these uh, HPC services that, that NERC operate. So, I mean, is, is um, a carbon footprint something that you've considered in your, in your digital thinking? I haven't personally. I mean, I, I think about it in the background because I think about carbon footprint, you know, every day now uh, through various things from, you know, supermarket shopping to, to driving and traveling and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I think I think with what we're doing here, the carbon footprint is is uh, without a doubt less than what the traditional approach would be. And, and that's because the traditional approach was, you know, the Environment Agency would have to mobilize teams of people to drive out to various locations around the coast. And, you know, and even worse than that, the, the approach before that was to actually build very big concrete seawalls everywhere. And I think actually, um, yeah, there's definitely a carbon footprint to digital solutions, but often they are enabling us to move away from some of those hard engineering approaches, um, you know, and, and the traditional approaches, which usually take more carbon. Balance, uh, balancing. Uh, yeah. Very good. Well, th thank you very much. I see we're, we're sort of coming up to time. And Jenny, I mean, I wonder if we could sort of turn to you to, as we as we draw to the end here, I'm just just interested. Looking back over this project um, and and how all you've achieved and the team to date, can you put your finger on particular best practices that um, that you'd like to highlight, either actual ones or or, or aspirational ones? Um, I think getting in touch with people early is the key thing uh, to successful projects. Um, it was quite a short timeline that we had to deliver all of this work. So getting local stakeholders involved to be able to quickly deploy instruments was very important. Um, getting our team of artists involved with the scientists early in the project was also important to make sure the art actually linked to what we were doing, because um, that was very new for us. We haven't really worked in that field before. Um, so yeah, early communications and just having a really good engaged team has been uh, the success of the project. Yeah, very, very much. Look, look, I've got to ask you this, um, just for the final question. If you're, if you looking back at yourself, if you were advising yourself at the beginning of the project, what would your advice be now with everything that you know? <laughs> My advice would be get a lot of sleep before the project starts because you're going to be worrying for an entire year that your kit's going to go on the Dawlish railway line. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately it hasn't, fortunately it it hasn't. <laughs> well i think uh that's that's a, a good point to sort of bring things to an end and uh we, we it was a good news we didn't we didn't block the railway with your your senses so that's good um really thank you so much jenny uh, kit lou tim and and sarah thank you so much for your discussion that's been really fascinating um i think we'll we'll bring things to an end now and thank you very much to the audience as well for all the questions that have come in and it's great to actually have the all of the project team to answer answer the, and have a really good discussion around what is a, a very topical and very important subject um i think you know we've heard also about this area of constructing a digital environment and of course this is something we'll pick up in in future webinars in this in this series as we move through each of the seven um, now we've heard from two of the demonstrator projects. We'll move through the other five projects and hear, hear their perspectives on, on how can, they are constructing a digital environment. Um, as ever, the, the video for this will be made available shortly when I've got a moment on the our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at NERC digital environment. And um, the, the, I'm sure Cameron's popped the, pop the address in the, in the chat. And we look forward very much to seeing you at the next webinar, which will be Friday, the 2nd of December, when we'll be discussing the Sensum project with Dr. Georgie Bennett and her colleagues. And the Sensum project is all about the sensing of landscapes undergoing hazardous hydrological movements. So that will be very fascinating and, and, and a, a contrast perhaps to, to the Cream Tea project. So thank you again to all the panelists. Thank you to the audience. And we'll draw things to a close now. Thank you very much.